everybody, welcome to our online service. We're so glad that we can connect with you today. Jump into the comments and say hello. Let us know how you're doing, how we can pray with and for your family this week. There's two really important announcements I want to give you. First of all, we're going to be having communion during this service. Pastor Adrian's going to be leading us through communion. So this is a great opportunity to go and grab those elements. That is any juice or water that you want to use, any kind of bread. These are symbols. As, that we will use as we go through communion today. So if you want to get those prepared, now is a great time to do that. Also, I want to remind you about our church family meeting that's coming up next Sunday, June 7th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. I will be sending you an email this week with the link for you to either view the, the meeting online or participate by calling into the meeting. So make sure to be checking for your email and prioritize this very important church family meeting next Sunday, June 7th at 3 p.m. All right, you guys, have a wonderful service and God bless you. Well, good morning, everyone. We are about to partake in communion together. This is one of the greatest things that we can do together as the body of Christ and as a local expression of his body through Shady Rest Bible Church. When we take communion, what we are doing is we are actively causing ourselves to remember the price that was paid for our sins in order to be able to bring us life and salvation that Jesus graciously paid and willfully gave up his life for us. And so this is much more than just symbols that they have come to represent. So if you have not placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I would ask you to not partake of communion. And I don't say this in a way to be mean, but when Jesus instituted what we commonly call communion, he did it at a very typical Passover supper. And he took common elements. So what he did is he brought new meaning to them about what was going to transpire about 24 hours later. And so those elements, the broken bread and the cup that represent his blood and his broken body do not carry any meaning if we have not placed our faith and trust in him as our personal Lord and Savior. So go ahead and take the time, if you haven't already, and gather those elements together. I'm going to read from Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 11, as he reminds us of what happened that night when Jesus instituted communion, as we walk through taking communion together as a church family. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, this is what we read. For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, Do this in remembrance of me. So you may partake of the bread. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Just a note before we pray and take the cup. Anytime covenant was instituted, when you look back at the Old Testament, it usually involved blood and some element of sacrifice. So here is Jesus taking an element of the table, wine, which they drank at that time, and basically said, this is going to be a reflection of my poured out blood and I'm making a new agreement with you. Covenant basically means like a contract or an agreement. It's much more than that, but it's really what it means at its base level. And that's what Jesus was doing when he poured out his blood. He was fulfilling the Old Testament law and bringing what newness of life would come to those who would believe. And he did that through his poured blood. So before we take this cup together, I want to just go ahead and pray and then we'll go ahead and partake of the cup. Well, Lord, we are so grateful for your sacrifice. We know that salvation doesn't cost us anything, but it costs you everything. And Lord, you willfully laid down your life. No man took it from you, as scripture says, but you willfully laid it down for us. You suffered tremendously through your broken body and your shed blood in order that we might receive life and we may have it all the more abundant. So I thank you today, Jesus, that those who have placed their faith and trust in you 
as we actively cause ourselves to remember through communion today everything that you did for us. May we never take for granted the cross. It may always be before us. And not just be something that's just the symbol, but something that spurs us on to this life that we have, this new life in Christ. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, amen. Partake of the cup. Paul goes on to finish and he says this, for as, verse 26, for as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time we take communion together, we are proclaiming. It's a gospel proclamation of what Jesus did for us. And until the day in which we drink it with him again in heaven, when we receive that cup together directly from the Savior himself. Well, God bless you as we continue on in the service. Morning, Pastor Mark here, helping out Pastor Pina with our study on the book of Ephesians. You know, no matter what your interests are, I'm sure you have someone that you have always wanted to imitate. Whether it's somebody in the sports field or music or art or other hobbies of interest. You have somebody that you want to imitate, that you really want to emulate because they're very good at what they do. For me personally, I started playing drums when I was about 15. This is one example, I guess, from, from my own personal experience. When I was about 15, 16 years old, I started playing drums. And I had heroes that I really wanted to emulate, heroes in the music world, drummers that I really wanted to play like jazz drummers, rock drummers, and this was before the days of YouTube. So we would really just watch the MTV or maybe there was some, here's an old one, VHS tape out there that we could get and, and just try to learn and copy and watch. That's what I would try to do. I really wish I had YouTube back then because some of the guys that I used to watch are doing stuff now and they're they're a little older but they're doing some of their techs their you know their style and their techniques now but we all do have somebody that we like or want to imitate that we like that we want to emulate this morning we're going to continue on in our study of Ephesians just before we're going to be in chapter 5 pastor pina had brought us through chapter 4 and last week we looked at what it meant to have a, a Christian mindset, a new mindset, and a new way of living. The Ephesian church were, was comprised of pagans that were just coming out of idolatry and temple worship. And these individuals were not living according to a new mindset or a Christian mindset. So, Pastor Pina had brought us through chapter 4, and Paul then in this chapter is taking us even further. And so our study is going to be in chapter 5, and I'm going to read through that, and we're just going to look at a couple verses, really some good stuff here. But just keep that in mind. You always want to usually emulate somebody that is really good at something and you want to kind of copy that and do what they're doing because you admire them so much. It could be in any field. Maybe it's even somebody that you're thinking of right now personally that that's in your family, maybe your mom or your your dad or grandparent or whoever, brother or sister. But again, keep that in mind, trying to imitate somebody or be like somebody who's good at something. I'm going to read in chapter 5 of Ephesians, and we're going to pick up in verse 1, and I'll read through this, and we're going to park on some of the verses, and we're going to 
mind some of the, the really good knowledge here that Paul has for us. Starting in chapter, or again, verse 5, chapter 1, Therefore, be imitators of God. There's that word, imitators. Be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetedness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually or moral or impure or who is covetedness or covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. I'm going to stop there for a minute. We'll continue on in just a moment. But let's, let's go back to verse 1. Therefore, Paul is saying, because he's going back to verse, or rather chapter 4, Again, he's further expounding what he was teaching the Ephesians about having a new mindset and a new way of living, a new way of life, a new way of thinking that goes beyond their idolatrous practices. He says, therefore, be imitators of God. So there, there it is, imitating God. Now, some of your translations may say, be followers of God. It's the same thing. When you follow somebody, you're really imitating what they're doing. You're trying to be as good as that person is, whether, again, it's in, in a sport or in music or cooking or business or whatever it is. Here he's saying, be imitators of God. But look at this. As beloved children. As beloved children. This is the first of three identities that Paul gives to the Ephesians. This is the first of three, and we'll look at the other two in just a minute. But he says, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, this is, again, a very different way of thinking for the Ephesians. Prior, they were pagans and practicing pagan worship in the temples, and they they could never have thought of themselves as being children of a deity. They thought of the deities as so much higher to them, and they spent most of their trying, time trying to either appease them, they were afraid of them. But here Paul is saying, be imitators of the true God as beloved children. So what a, what a beautiful new title. Now, it's not just a title given to the Ephesians. We are that as well. Some centuries later, this still pertains to us. We are children of God, and so we can imitate our Father. Now, this is kind of curious, because when we imitate somebody, we are able to see them. So, Going back to my days as a teenager, I could watch my favorite drummer. I can watch him with his sticking technique or, or whatever he was doing with his feet. I could watch that. He was a physical person. But God is spirit. So how then can we, as children of, of God, imitate God who is spirit and who is unseen? Well, I like this because Paul kind of further expounds on it. He kind of starts building it out for the Ephesians. So let's build this together. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children 
And look at this. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus, and here's some theology, and some of you who have been in church a long time are familiar with this, and maybe some who are just joining in or, or are curious. Jesus is the perfect representation of the Godhead. He is the living word. Jesus Christ is God, the Son. He is deity. He is God. And he represents God in the flesh. He's the perfect representation of that. He is also 100% human. And that is something that is a myster um, it's mysterious to us. It's a mystery to us. We know more about what it doesn't mean, and we kind of have faith in what we draw from the Bible as to what it really means. So Jesus is 100% God, and he's 100% man. And it's a perfect union of the two, but he is fully God. So he then gives us the tangible, physical way in which we can study how God can be imitated. Because we, as beloved children, can look at the Son of God and walk as he did. Now, Jesus loved us and gave himself to us as a sacrifice. So that's one thing that we learn as we, as we are children of God. How we imitate God is to walk like his Son in sacrificial love. And you'll see this even further expounded in perfect community with each other. So Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's an Old Testament reference about the, the burning of incense and how that was like atonement for the sins of the people of Israel back in the Old Testament and went up to God, a sweet, savory uh, offering. Well, Jesus did that for us, and so it's like a sacrifice to God, and we are that aroma. His, his sacrifice for us is that fragrant aroma. And so we then look to Christ as our example. So Paul is putting together the Godhead here, a perfect unity between God the Father and God the Son. And he's painting a picture of community between the two. I want you to look at something very interesting here, just real quickly. I'm going to read it from from the Gospel of John, this might help you understand this relationship that Jesus had with the Father, how God the Son and God the Father lived in perfect community with one another, and how Jesus showed us how God walks himself. This is interesting. It says, So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, and this is found in, again in the Gospel of John, in verse 19, so, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life. To whom he will. So whatever the son sees the father doing, that also is what Jesus is doing. How Jesus lived, how he lived among us on earth, is how God, the Father, is to be imitated. So it's very, very interesting how Paul puts this together. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If I were going to put a truth statement here, it would sound like this. Like father, like son, like beloved children. Imitate the Godhead. Love one another in perfect unity. Like father, like son, like beloved children. That's us. Imitate the Godhead. We imitate the Godhead, love one another in perfect unity. In perfect unity. 
Now, let's take a look at verse 3. This is kind of interesting. This could be taken in a lot of different ways, but we'll work through it together. Paul goes on and says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So again, sexual immorality, all impurity, covetedness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. That's the second identifier that Paul gives to the Ephesians. And remember, the first one was, we are beloved children, or the Ephesians were beloved children. We are beloved children. He calls them saints. We are saints. Now, that is a wonderful word. I love the word saint. It can be misunderstood. Sainthood is not something that you have to earn. You don't have to be canonized. There is no ritual that one, a high priest or whomever comes and makes you a saint. A saint is one who has been, it, grace has been bestowed upon them and they receive that and they are then sanctified. Sainthood means blameless, sacred, consecrated, or holy. It means you're set apart. doesn't mean that you are perfect or that you are in any way uh, some kind of a miracle worker. It simply means that you've been pulled away. You are consecrated. You are a saint in God's eyes. This is yet another kind of new thing for the Ephesians to, to think about now as themselves. Boy, we're beloved children, and now, now he's calling us saints. So, as a saint, Paul is saying to them, live it out now. Live what you really are. Live as though you are really priceless and that you are called out. You are an example. See, a lot of times people can look at a passage like this and think that if they can refrain from sexual immorality and impurity or covetedness, if they cannot joke around and, and they are being good, then they are saints. It doesn't work that way. You have been, Paul's fashioning the, 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 the teaching in such a way that he is saying, because you are saints through the sacrificial love of Jesus and what he did for you, now you live it out and you imitate God and you, and you live in community with one another as saints. Now, that's another interesting thing about the book of Ephesians because the, really the theme of Ephesians, of Ephesians is a, a, like a community love, a familial love, a restoration, a recreation of what community should be. And it's built around and centered around the sacrificial love of Jesus. And so he's telling the Ephesian church to commune together and to unify together and to live as saints and an example. So, so things like sexual immorality and uh, coarse joking or foolish talk, uh, all of those things may have been something they did while in the pagan world. And he's not talking necessarily when he says a uh, crude joking has nothing to do with Paul is somehow against humor. Humor is great. I mean, we all love, I do. I love a, a good comedian or, or a hearty kind of laugh and funny things. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not telling us that we need to sit and be prudish. He is, this has to do more with jokes that maybe tear one another down. Or, or are not edifying to all audiences, because that creates a disunity and a non-community. And Paul is telling us to live communally the way the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit live, together in a perfect family. Just love how he, he just starts, again, with be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us. And then he calls us you know, beloved children and saints, and we're, we're, we're fully learning how the, 
we're we're imitating the Godhead as a community of believers. So I would say if I had another truth statement, and this will be my second truth statement, I would say this concerning verse three and, and what we're learning so far, live out as live as you are called out. Live as you are called out. Live that way. Live your live out not being overly judgmental, but show your 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 sainthood through how Christ loved you and how you can emanate that love to your church family and then even to to the rest of the world. I want to talk about the third identifier that Paul gives to the Ephesians, and it's found here starting in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So you are light in the Lord. This is the third thing. The Ephesians were beloved children. They were, were called saints. And now here they're called light in the Lord or children of light. We are those three things too. We are beloved children of the Lord. If you are a believer in Christ, you are a beloved child of God. You are a saint and you are a child of the light or light in the Lord. It's a beautiful way that Paul is building up again how to live as a community of believers. It's a community that functions and, and imitates the Godhead, the way the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit interact with each other. They're all distinct, all three are distinct eternally, but they're all God. And it's just a really, really beautiful illustration or reality to how the Christian community should live. If I were going to make a truth statement, this is my third truth statement, I would say this. I would sum it up as this. Beloved children of God make a community of lighted saints. Beloved children of God make a community of lighted saints. We build each other up. We exhort one another to good works. The Bible is replete. The New Testament is replete with verses uh, that teach us to, to walk as Christ walked, to live as a community the way the Godhead lives. I'm going to pray a prayer for you. I'm first, before I do that, I would like to invite you the listener out there that maybe has never heard the gospel or has never heard a Bible passage taught quite like this or has never really believed that he or she could be called a child of God, who could be actually forgiven of their sins. Maybe church, when you were little, has in some way made you feel like you need to be somehow sanitary when you walk through the doors, or you have to be cleaned up before you could sit in the auditorium. It's just not that way. Jesus came to a condemned world to save it. The world is condemned already. Jesus came to call sinners to himself. He truly, truly, deeply, deeply loves you very, very much, and he wants you to be a part of the same community that the Ephesian believers were called into. Paul was very, very, really, really fired up to get the Ephesians to really believe their new way of life. And we here at Shady Rest want you as well to know that you can be a part of a community like the church, in the church, and be your gifts can be used as well that you have. It's a simple faith in the finished works of Christ. Remember, way back in our first verse, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Everything that we've ever done, anything that you... We're all born into sin, so it really doesn't even matter how much wrong we've done. We are just under God's wrath the moment we're, we're born. But Christ came and called sinners to himself. Simple faith in the finished work 
of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. There is no real specific prayer. It's just a brokenness that a person knows inside of them and cries out to the only lover of their soul, and that's Jesus. This prayer is really a prayer that comes and guides you more than tells you what to say. So I'm going to close out the message this morning. I'm so thankful that you were able to join us through this this medium of cyberspace, and I'm going to pray us out. Thank you so much, Lord. I just want to pray for any who don't know you this morning. Maybe there is that one listening in this morning that really knows that they need you and that they desperately want to to come to a peace in their own heart about things that they have done or this emptiness that they maybe feel inside. I pray that you would reveal to them your true love for them, that they would know that Jesus is there and that whatever they utter to Christ will be heard, he will in no way cast out a broken sinner coming to find refreshing water. Jesus is living water, bread. He's all those things that we need. He spoke of himself to us in words of sustenance, things that we need to live. I am the bread of life. I am living waters. So I just pray that whoever it is would find that this morning or would seek it out in the week to come. We thank you for your goodness to us. Enshroud us with your love. And we thank you for being able to meet in this way. Always in Christ we'll pray. Amen. Thank you for joining and listening this morning. All right, guys. Well, another week of online services come to a close. And you know we like to finish every service by praying this benediction, our blessing from our family to yours. And we want to take the opportunity to do that now. So now go, go into, into the, the world, world in peace. peace. Have, Have courage. courage. Hold, Hold on, on to what is good and honor all men. men. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you till we see each other again. God bless you guys. We love you all so much. Have a great week, guys. We'll see you again next week for our online service. God bless you. God bless, guys.